Hi, everyone who signed in early. We, um, we had a very large uh, registration rate, so we're going to wait for people to uh, uh, kind of come into the door as, uh, as often is the case. So we're hold tight. It's not quite six o'clock yet. It's just six, everyone, so we're going to give it a few minutes. Okay, well, it's just after six. So in um, respect for those of you that uh, signed on in time, I think I'm gonna get started. Uh, people will just jump in when they, uh, when they arrive. So um, thank you all for spending um, an hour with us this evening. I hope you find this to be informative. Uh, I want to um, begin by, um, uh, first of all, honoring or uh, uh, thanking the um, uh, Community Foundation of Eastern Connecticut, which has provided a Connecticut Votes for Animals support uh, over the years in doing these educational workshops. We're really very grateful that they uh, offer this, uh, provide us with this support so that we can provide this uh, to the public. And um, <clears throat> uh, obviously tonight we have a representative Jane Garibay uh, Jane represents Windsor and Windsor Locks, and she's going to talk to us uh, later on in the program about um, uh, her views about how to get uh, how people should be involved in the legislative process. Just some housekeeping rules. The chat's off, uh, but we have the Q&A section uh, of the um, uh, site is there. And so I would encourage you to, as we go through uh this presentation to put your questions in the Q&A box and hopefully uh, we'll get to them at the end of the program. Um, so with that, I am going to start. Um, again, welcome to Connecticut Votes for Animals. This is our regional advocacy 101 workshop. This is the third of five workshops that we're doing. Uh, um, and we've broken up the state and regions. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And um, 
Uh, this is um, uh, what we call region one. And, um, and Jane Garibay represents some of the towns in this region. And um, so it's just an, an opportunity for us to kind of organize the state a little bit differently for our advocacy roles. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, what's going on? Ah, here we go. Okay, what are we gonna cover? I'm going to tell you a little bit about us, CVA. We're going to talk about how a bill gets uh, becomes law, how to get involved. And then we're going to hear from Representative Garibay. We'll quickly go through our legislative priorities for the 2023, can't even say that number, uh, session. We're going to talk a little bit about our regional captains, and then we'll have a wrap up and opportunity for questions and answers. Um, about us. Um, CVA, as you know, uh, is a Connecticut-based organization, and our priorities are all based on what we believe people in the state are interested in. And uh, we're a grassroots 501c4 organization that allows us to lobby at the state in order to provide stronger protections for Connecticut's animals. We represent all animals. We're talking about domestic, wildlife, as well as uh, farm animals. We haven't done much in the latter uh, area, but we certainly are working a lot on wildlife and obviously um, our companion animals. Uh, our focus is on the state legislature. We do periodically uh, get involved or support federal legislation that involves animals and will have an impact on the state of Connecticut. But all of our focus is exclusively on the uh, Connecticut General Assembly. We now have close to 8,000 supporters. That's both uh, uh, email supporters as well as our social media followers. And you can, again, once again, we're advocating for pro-animal policies. We try to do educational programs like this. We've done others. We'll do others throughout the uh, session. We try to get uh, our supporters to have, to talk to their legislators so that we can get good uh, animal laws passed uh, in the state. And the idea is by doing that to try to build awareness with our state legislators about the priority of animal issues in Connecticut. So how a bill becomes law, I'm kind of throwing this up there because I really like this picture. Uh, one of our volunteers put this together for us. I think it's just so great. And I think it reflects kind of where we are. We have all of these animals kind of waiting at the state capitol to find out what's, what their uh, future uh, will be. I want to briefly talk about uh, federal versus the roles of federal versus state. And I do this because um, oftentimes, not oftentimes, periodic periodically throughout the year, we'll send out an alert and ask people to contact their state legislators. And I'll get comments back from people and then they'll say things like, why didn't you include um, Representative Larson? Why didn't you include Senator Murphy? Uh, why do you only have, and then they would click off the state representatives. Well, that's because those folks are federal. They're in the United States Congress. And while they're very important to us, and we just had an election and, and all of our dele congressional delegation was reelected, um, they don't have any impact over the laws that are passed in the state of Connecticut. So our focus is on the 151 state representatives and uh, the 36 state senators. Remember, you have one representative that represents you, one state representative, and one state senator represents your town. It's a very large geographic area, many towns in addition to that. Connecticut General Assembly, which is where we're going to focus all of our uh, discussion today, uh, runs in kind of two-year cycles. We call it the long session, which is always the session right after immediately following um, an election. So it's the odd year. So we're going into the 2023 session, which begins Wednesday, January 4th, and it goes for six months until June 7th. The and 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 during this process, there are what's important about this uh, long session for you, particularly as constituents, is that legislators propose bills during that period of uh, during these types of sessions. You'll see later they don't do it the following year. Um, the budget is adopted, and there are big policy issues that are addressed in these long sessions. The second term, if you will, which would be the even years 
uh, is called the short session that runs from February 7th until May 8th. Um, again, the significance for advocates is that individual members don't propose bills. Uh, it's the bills that move through uh, the process are bills that come out of committee. It's a little tougher. Uh, obviously, the session is collapsed in terms of time. It's only three months. We push real, everybody pushes really hard uh, to meet all of the deadlines and to get a number of bills over the finish line. Um, as you know, the General Assembly is comprised of two chambers. Um, in the Senate, we just had an election in November, and the Senate, you know, the composition of the General Assembly stayed pretty close. Uh, to what it was in the past. I think there was a plus one on the uh, Democratic side uh, in the House. And, um, but in the Senate, there are 24, 36 total members, 24 are Democrats, 12 are Republicans. I just want to bring your attention to the leadership uh, in the Senate because we'll be talking about them throughout the year. I want you to become familiar with their names. Uh, Senator Martin Looney from New Haven is the president of the Senate and Bob Duff is the majority leader. That means they make a lot of decisions about how bills if how bills are, are disposed of, if they go forward or not. On the Republican side, they have Kevin Kelly um, from the Stratford area. He is the Republican uh, president and uh, they have not, well, they have not announced their, um, uh, their new uh, people, other leadership people that they have. On the House side, 151 members, that's a lot. For those of you that don't know it, Connecticut has 168 separately incorporated towns. Um, but we have 98 Democrats and 53 uh, Republicans. The Speaker of the House is Matt Ritter from Hartford. The Majority Leader is um, Jason Rojas uh, from the Manchester area. On the Republican side, it's uh, Vinnie Candelora from North Brantford. He's uh, and then we have the deputy leader is uh, Tom O'Day. And again, uh, because of the election, there's um, we're going to have new, uh, not leadership positions. I, I think the leaders are pretty much going to say what as they've been in the past. But certainly there will be new committee assignments. There'll be new chairs for the committee uh, of, of those committees. The General Assembly has a website which is incredibly helpful, chock full of information. And if you can see where I put my cursor, one of the most important things is it'll tell you who your representative is if you don't know who that is now. Why did my cursor go away? Oh dear, here we go. It'll tell you the various committees and we're gonna talk about it You know, at, at some point during the course of the <clears throat> early part of the session in January, we'll want to know who's on the committees that we are particularly interested in. You can find that information if we don't send it out to you beforehand, you can find it on this website. So it's a really, it's a great, uh, it's actually a great website. Sometimes it's not so easy to navigate, but it's just got a lot of information on it. So, you know, if we were ha if we were an in-person um, uh, workshop, I would ask people to raise their hands. How many people know who their state legislators are? But we're not in person, so you can do that privately. Uh, and I ask you to think about, um, oh, I see somebody raised their hand. That's very cute. Thank you, Alex. And um, uh, so, we, um, uh, so we're going to um, have you find out who your state representative is if you don't know. So if you'd like to pull out your phones and you type in cga.ct.gov, that stands for Connecticut General Assembly, the state of Connecticut and gov is obviously for government. You'll see on the drop down menu here, it says representation. You hit that and it says find your legislators. You have to put in your town, your street, uh, your street name and your street number. Now, let me quickly tell you why this is important. People say, well, I don't wanna give my street. Well, you have to because legislative districts are divided by by address, the numbers of people, and the it's not town by town. Many times, um, New Britain, for instance, has multiple state legislators, and you can have you can have like a big street, let's just say Main Street, and half of it could be represented by one person, and the other half could be represented by another. For you to find your right representative, 
you need to put in your street name and your street number. So if you do that, you hit find and this will come up. This is my town. That happens to be my town hall uh, street address. And these are my representatives. And this is the way you'll see it when you do that information on uh, in your own on your own phone or in your using your own computer. Just so that you know, it's never simple, right? Um, these are the representatives that represented you um, and who may change, who those representatives may not be the same representatives when they take office, which will be on January 4th. This is the old list. So for instance, in my instance, Sean Scanlon was, um, was elected, he decided not to run as a state representative and somebody else uh, ran in that for that seat and was elected, Moira. Uh, and you'll see her name there after, after January 4th. Uh, Sean's gone to become controller. And uh, Christine Cohen is the state senator. Uh, Christine also happens to be, uh, she won re-election and she also happens to be chair of the environment committee. So, in your, if you've done it on your phone, so you do it on your computer, this is, so if you ever have a question about who your representative is, this is the way to be able, this is the way to find them. Okay, the other thing that that website has is it gives you tremendous amount of information about legislation and the status of legislation, where it is and what people's votes have been. I'm using this as a, um, this was uh, in the 2022, our past short session. And this happened to be our um, adequate shelter bill, 5170. So I kind of put it in. So on the, on the front page or actually on any page, if you hover at the bottom of that CGA site, what will come up is something called a quick bill search. So you put in the year that you're looking for, it was last year, 2022, and then you put in the bill number. And what comes up is just this tremendous amount of information about that legislation, including an analysis of it that's done in plain English so that you don't have to read the statutory language to figure out what's going on. Um, if there were amendments on the bills, the, the, um, the votes on the bills, both in committee and as well as um, the floor, and then you'll see the history of the bill with the last date first. You can see here it was signed by the governor of the, on the 23rd of May. And it will give you, and you can't see it because the whole page is not being shown, but you will see the, the, the path that that bill took from the time it was introduced until the time it was, we were very lucky in this instance that it was signed by the governor. As I said, it's just chock full of information. It may sound a little odd right now, but as we get into session and we start sending you information about bills with bill numbers and so on, you'll find this to be very handy instead of, you know, always call us or send us an email and ask us a question, whatever happened to X bill? Or if you wanna know about it on your own, Go to the CGA website and you can get that information. It's very handy. Okay, so how a bill becomes law. Well, I like to say that they don't happen uh, by themselves. It is a lot of work. It's a lot of work to get something passed. And it's a lot of work sometimes to defeat a bill um, if you're not paying attention. And these are just some examples of some of the things that CVA has been intimately involved with. One of them is uh, Desmond's Law which many of you are familiar with, have heard about. It was passed in 2016. It was my first year with CVA as their lobbyist. And um, Connecticut was the first state in the country to enact this law that provides an advocate in the courtroom uh, to further justice in animal cruelty cases. Um, second bill, obviously, we're very pleased about because it just passed last year was this adequate shelter for outside dogs. Uh, this is something that we've wanted, that animal control officers have wanted for a very long time to provide very specific, uh, to give very specific guidance so that animal, about what constitutes adequate shelter during, uh, for dogs that are kept outside during extreme weather conditions. And we're talking about not just, you know, not just uh, the fact that it's cold, but whether or not a dog 
is, you know, is a senior dog, doesn't have a lot of hair. Uh, there are different criteria. And, you know, and this came out of a case in Fairfield. And it was the Fairfield delegation who came to us about, uh, about this uh, issue and they wanted to do something about it. So uh, in any event, we're very pleased that it made it over the finish line. And we know we heard from animal control officers who have said, you know, they get calls from neighbors who said, I keep hearing a dog barking and howling. And what can I do? Because they're very constrained. There was nothing, there was nothing really in the law to give them the ability to be able to work with that homeowner to find an appropriate solution for that dog. Un you know, what they were left with oftentimes beforehand was not being able to do anything until the dog was truly suffering and on the kind of doorstep of death. And then it became an animal cruelty charge, which has its own set of issues. Um, so where do these ideas come from? Well, you'll see when we talk about our priorities for next year, a lot of it comes from unfinished business. Um, you get bills that you know, you can't oftentimes don't pass a bill in one year. By the way, that shelter bill we first brought out in 2017 and it made it through the floor, but never made it through the Senate. So people feel that there's unfinished business. You know, we've been able to educate legislators. They understand the, the it's greater. They understand the importance of it. And so you take another, if you will, bite at the apple. Uh, obviously, legislators have their own agendas, things that they want to do for their communities things that they may want to do for you. If you have a particular issue that you think warrants uh, state intervention, talk to your legislator about it. They might introduce a piece of legislation. And then obviously the state agencies also uh, have their own agenda and uh, they want to have um, bills uh, brought in. Oops, hold on, sorry. So, um, I've kind of skipped to the public hearing process, but let me just quickly tell you that when a bill gets introduced, it goes through a number of different uh, hurdles before you finally get to the, the hearing process, but it gets introduced, it gets assigned to the committee. As I said, our committees tend to be environment and also judiciary. And, um, and the leadership of those committees takes a look at literally the thousands of bills that have been assigned to them. Um, and they make some recommendations that they then bring back to the committee to say, well, what do you think about this? Should we raise this bill? Should we bring it to a public hearing? Should we move it along the process? The committee makes a vote. Then that list gets smaller, gets brought back, and then you do a public hearing. You can't have a law on a bill without first having a public hearing. And these public hearings are critical. It's really an opportunity for the legislators to hear from the public and to hear from the agencies and to hear from the experts about what is good or bad about the idea contained in this, in this bill. Um, once that happens, um, once they go through the hearing process and you'll know, you'll be hearing from us a lot about the hearings because we're gonna want you to be in touch with your legislators about bills that we wanna make sure gets get moved out of the committee. Um, uh, once uh, that happens, the, once they've had the hearing, then the bills come back and to the committee, they make a decision about whether uh, they're going to take final action on that bill or not. And once they do, the bill is then out of committee and you, and you jump up and down and you say, oh, wow, we're gonna have a law. Not so fast. Not that easy. So the bill comes out of committee. First place it goes is the Office of Legislative Research. It doesn't make any difference. Those are the people that look over the language that says, you know what? This is gonna, this is, this is, the language is problematic for, it makes some problems for the Connecticut Constitution. Most of them just say, no, it's fine. Or if they are, they work out the kinks. Uh, then they also review them to make sure that it doesn't have a fiscal impact on the state. Uh, or the citizens, or if it does, they want to know what that is, and that has to be clearly outlined on the bill. So they do all of this, and, and this is done, like in the long session, it's going to be uh, probably March, early to mid to late March, April, uh, when all of the committees will 
pass out their bills. You can imagine that those offices, OLR and the fiscal analysis folks, they got a pile of stuff to go through before they're ready uh, to go for the floor. So um, then you have to go to the floor. And this is, a, it's a dance extraordinaire that happens uh, when uh, to try to get a bill actually called on the floor and then voted on. But it happens in a very condensed period of time in Connecticut, uh, oftentimes really in the last three weeks of the session. So we're talking about uh, mid-May until the first week of June. And poor legislators are asked that oftentimes have to be there all night long. They have to pull these all night sessions. It's, there's got to be a better way to, um, I don't know, to make a law, but that's how, that's how Connecticut does it. So uh, also so that you know, with bills, if a bill is introduced um, by a senator, it has to go to that chamber first. It's introduced by a representative, it goes to the house first. Oftentimes that's a strategy. If they know they're gonna have trouble in one chamber, they wanna make sure that it maybe starts in the other chamber first. And that really helps propel the bill um, to go forward. So as I said, thousands of bills get reported out of committee, but less than 300 actually get called for a vote. And this voting process is extraordinarily uh, complex. And it's a lot of stuff that happens that we don't, we as the advocates certainly don't have access to those kinds of discussions directly because it's all happening in the chamber where we're not allowed, which is appropriate. Um, but we're always grabbing legislators as they're coming out of the chamber to ask, well, what happened here or what happened there? So they um, so they do a lot of negotiations. They the Republican caucuses and the Democratic caucuses discuss discuss various bills that they're going to do. There's something called the screening committee. You'll hear about that also during the course of the session. And that's really made up of legislators and they make decisions for you know political reasons and. And for what they believe, you know, needs to be done on certain legislation about which bills are going to go forward. And then if that weren't enough, the chambers negotiate with one another. So the House will have a list of bills and they'll go over to the Senate and they'll go, all right, you know, we'll do this bill, that bill and that bill if you do our bills. And the Senate says, no, we won't. We'll do that bill, that bill, but we're not going to do this bill. Seriously, this happens and it happens back and forth. Um, late until the night, early until the morning at the end of the session. So once all of those negotiations happen, suddenly you're advocating for a bill and suddenly you get a text from the bill sponsor that says, the bill, they're gonna run the bill. They're gonna go on the floor. And suddenly there's a big flurry of activity. Um, we've been contacting you all this time telling you to contact your legislators to make sure that the bill gets a called and b when it gets called that uh they vote the right way on it and then bingo you got victory the bill passes both chambers and then it goes to the governor's office for his signature so how do you get involved there are a couple of things that you need to do first of all we ask you to don't forget, find out who your legislator is. And when you click on their name, by the way, you'll be able to see uh, which committees they're on. And that's very important for you to know, particularly, as I said, uh, because we focus on certain committees primarily. Um, I would encourage you to follow that legislator and, and certainly Representative Garibay can tell us about this later. Oftentimes legislators have informal meet and greets uh, in their community um, at, between the election time and the beginning of the session or sometime the first couple of weeks in the session. So they get an opportunity to talk to their constituents and hear from them and hear what it is that they're really concerned about. You should be at those meetings. Follow them on Facebook, Twitter, whatever social media um, you follow so that when those meetings happen, you can go there and say, you know what, I'm a constituent, I vote, and I'm really concerned about these animal issues. You can say generally animals, or there may be a particular issue that you're concerned about. And we would encourage you to do that because if they don't hear from you 
they don't know. You know, they only know what they what they've heard about or they know about. Um, oh, right. And we're going to ask you to, um, you know, contact them early and often. We're going to walk through what the action alerts are uh, and about writing on them, on these issues. So what are the specific things you could do? Testify at a committee hearing. We're going to encourage you to do that. We're going to show you how to do it. Um, Attend those meetings, as we mentioned. Uh, write letters to the editor. If you feel prompted and uh, or passionately about an issue, we don't have a lot of print media left, but we have some. You have local papers. You also have local um, uh, Facebook pages where places that you can kind of raise awareness in your community about an issue involving protecting animals. So I mentioned, we're gonna be sending you alerts. So look at this page, because you're gonna see this often from us. Um, we depend on communicating with you through two, in two forms, one through email and two through social media. We do Facebook, Instagram, not so much Twitter. We'll get better with it, I think, assuming that Twitter continues to exist, uh, but that's another topic. Okay. so. When a bill, when we think there's going to be a hearing on a bill and we want you to testify, we're going to send out something called an action alert that says we need you to do something. And in this instance, this is actually on Greyhound Dog Racing. This bill is going to, this bill made it through committee last year and it's going to come back this coming year and it's one of CVA's priorities. So um, we're going to need your help in making sure that um, legislators are aware of the need and why this bill needs to move forward. So we'll send you this alert. We're gonna make it very easy. We're gonna ask you to testify or send a note that just says, please support this bill. Um, we'll make it very easy. We'll give you talking points. We would encourage people to take this information and put it in your own words. We will give you the address of the of the committee and when it has to be sent in, it makes it really easy. You just cut and paste, put it in your email and send it off. Couldn't be easier for you to do, but it means an awful lot. This is the second one that we do, legislative alerts. This is when we've got a, when we've got, um, uh, when we've got a uh, vote coming up. Again, this is the shelter bill. And this was like, says here the last three weeks, of uh, the session. And uh, we have recently, last year, we, we, we purchased a system that makes it very easy for you to reach out to your legislator to know, so that they know that you think this bill is important and you want their support. And you, we ask you to click there, we, we give you background and we say, click here to take action. And it brings you to a page and uh, gives you an opportunity to say a couple of words about, I really like this bill, I, or this bill is really important to me. Your vote and support on this bill is really important to me. And then you hit send and you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to know who your legislator is, although I would encourage you to do that. Uh, you don't have to know what their email address is, more importantly. We will do all of that for you. That happens in our you know, what is it, the, uh, the the back office of the system. And it sends the emails directly to the legislator's office. We make it real easy. We tried it last year. We got a lot of very positive feedback from CVA supporters who said, oh my gosh, this has been, this is so much easier than what it used to be, which was, you know, if you didn't know who your legislator were, you had to go to that General Assembly website. You had to put in your address. It pops up the name and you had to cut and paste the name and the email address. Then you had to put it in your email and then you had to write the, the email to the legislator. You know, it just never happened. This is just a whole bunch easier for you. So as we go throughout the process, expect to get things um, like that as well. So I have now come to the end of um, my little speech. And now I'm gonna turn things over 
to Representative Garibay, and I have to remember, I'm going to stop sharing. That's what I'm going to do. Ah, there we go. That's the right size. Hi, welcome. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Julianne. That was a great presentation. Oh. One of the best I've seen. Oh, I thank you. So congratulations. It was very thorough. Oh, thanks. Um, so can you, um, you know, we, we're doing these workshops because I want people to understand the process so that they know during the next six months uh, kind of what's going on at Capitol Hill, where we are in that process, so that when I send out a, um, an alert, uh, they're going to go, oh, yeah, I remember that. I remember where they are in that process. I guess I ought to do something. So that was that's kind of that was the idea behind this. But I want to know from from the legislator side of things. Um, how important it is, is it for you to hear from your constituents about a particular bill? It's extremely important and um, in many for many reasons. Um, first of all, like you said, there's 5,000 bills hitting or plus hitting coming out from our committees. About two to maybe at the max 400 are going to make it to the floor in any way, shape, or form or have a hearing. So for me, it's a constant contact. So during election time, I'm door knocking. I'm asking people, is this important? What's important to you? That is a perfect example to start the conversation with your legislator, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's building that relationship with your legislator. Like you said, going to the coffee hours, et cetera. But there's also many of us that meet Saturday mornings at the local coffee shops and have coffee with someone. Um, and so it's just very important that that personal attention to pull out the bills that we may not see if I'm not on environment. I do know more about um, the animal bills, but you know it's hard for everyone to know everything. So writing um, an email, I love texting myself. I really? put my cell phone out on everything because it comes right to me where an email might be once a day that text comes through and I can just answer, they're quicker. Um, and the more personal you make it, because there are a lot that come through and they go to every legislator. You can see it goes to every legislator. It's not tailored, et cetera. So it makes you hear. But when I get from someone that says, you know what, I have a personal story. There was a dog in a car on a hot day and this is what happened. That's why we need this law. Or, you know, I traveled to Japan and I saw what they did with shark fins. And, you know, I'm still aghast. So those personal stories just hit home a little bit more. They don't have to be elaborate. Um, and I think we've all had with the animals in some way, shape or form um, come, but they're very, very important. And to keep the contact starting now, because once we're in session, we're gonna be moving, like we're gonna be getting your email, you know, things are gonna hit the floor and you told it perfectly. First is getting a hearing. And right there, how many can we hear out of 5,000 bills? Exactly. Sometimes right. it takes a couple of years. Um, so again, it comes to those relationships, even with us. Um, last session, I did the, um, the bill on naming the state animal, the rescue animal. Right, right. It got a hearing. Dan Fox, Rep Fox was wonderful. He loved it. We called it the bandit bill after uh, my rescue animal, my rescue dog. Yeah. And he was fantastic. It passed overwhelmingly in the House. It had a hearing. It passed. And then it got blocked in the Senate for reasons I won't go into. Um, so it can. So a we are bringing it again this year. I asked Rep. Fox, I said, should I just consider it dead? And there are people that laugh. I mean, seriously. Right. You know? Oh, I know. I remember. <laughs> you know? And yes, if you're talking about a child dying, that's, you know, takes, you know, over um possibly an animal issue but why can't we have it all right why can't we well you know we would certainly ask that question why can't we have it all you know it's so it it's always so interesting to me we don't the animal 
the animal people don't ask for a lot, you know, none of our bills ever cost money. We are talking about just being kind, not being cruel to animals. That's what we asked for. We're asking people to be good people. Yeah. And it's so hard. I don't get it. I don't get it. But anyway, (laughs) Um, do you think, is it, is it good for you to get multiple communications? Um, I mean, is it good for you to get, um, for, 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 for a bill to get your attention? What do you think? Does it take, you know, five or six people to, to email you about this or, um, it's, a, it's good to get a few because it sticks in your mind and the more personalized and if they're a constituent, again, there are people that send it out to every legislator, even though it's not. And when people look in there, I answer all my emails. So some people have their aides, it's all different. But when I go down and I see they're from North Brantford or somewhere else, I don't right. pay as much attention, but I see Windsor, Windsor Locks and I wanna know. Um, I'll answer them. Do you want to meet to talk? Tell me, you know, what your story is. Why is this important to you? So having a few is good. Even when you're pro something, it's good to have that support, right? Right. So that, that helps you when you go into those caucus right. meetings, right? Right. I've heard from people, you know, the right. public hearings, testifying um, on human services, some of the um, health care um, issues really influenced me in how I was going to vote. So I think it's very important. Yeah, I I think it's so important to hear that from you because I don't, you know, you sometimes think, I I sometimes think that it's difficult. First of all, I think it's very hard for people to to reach out to their legislators. This is right. This is foreign territory for most people, right? And, um, and then secondly, they, um, they, they think, well, why should I bother? Right. And I want you to tell them they should bother because it matters, right? Because to you. it matters. And we listen, we're different from the federal um, legislators. Mm. You know, um, we live in our towns, especially House of Representatives, the senators have a much bigger area. It's like 80,000 or, you know, but for us, I think it's 22,000. So our area is much smaller, Um, like myself, my kids grew up here, I grew up in Windsor, Um, came back to Windsor to bring up our children. I know people have been involved in the community. So hopefully with your state representative, you feel more, um, you know, see them at the grocery store and say, hey, do you have a minute? I don't, I personally, um, what's the word? I like being stopped and talked to. That's why we're in this. And we have to know what our constituents think. And most of the time it shores up what our beliefs are, right? Mm-hmm. And I would say, right, I was right for fighting for the state animal to be the rescue animal. People were passionate about it. Right. Um, so it, it, that's why it's important. And to say hello to them when you see them out in the community, et cetera. Yeah, I hope people hear that because I, I, I think the other thing too, people tend to be, I don't know, intimidated, uh, mm-hmm. right? By legislators, they go, oh, well, you know, they're a position of power, they don't want to hear from me, uh, blah, blah. Yeah. No, not true. Human, you know, neighbor. Right. I think that would be most legislators that I know in the House of Representatives are not that way. We feel we're just one in the community, but our role is um, you know, to fight for legislation that affects our district in a positive way. Someone else might be, um, you know, head of a nonprofit, the food bank. We all have our different roles, bringing up a family and teaching your kids, you know, um, how to be involved. So there's many ways that we all contribute and it doesn't make one avenue better than the other. Mm-hmm. That's great. Um, so timing. When do you want to hear from folks? When the bill's introduced throughout the process? Yeah, uh, I think right now is the perfect time. Election's over. We yeah. read up all that door knocking time every day. Um, we're not going into legislation yet. I know the animal caucus, we've already met and we were just asked for, they gave us a list of everything we talked about, our five top priorities for each legislator that's in that animal caucus. Oh. Um, 
So we're already starting to look at what are, we'll, we will promote every bill that comes through that helps animals, but we're gonna concentrate on the top five. So we'll see what comes out of that because everybody has a little bit different. Oh, that's interesting. So, so, so it's it's the co-chairs are David, Michelle, and yeah. Nicole, uh, Clara Destitria. Uh, yeah. So they've asked you for your top five issues. Yeah, and I didn't pull it out right away last week. And um, Rep. Michelle's like, "Jane, hey, where's your top five? You know, <laughs> and he sends me the list again. So I got that in. Um, so it is important to hear your voices now of what's you know important. You know, even like myself as a legislator, I didn't know a couple of years ago how, how important it was to ban greyhound racing. Because mm -hmm. I thought we don't have it in the state, but if we leave it right. open, it can happen. And they also allow betting like in places from here, like in Mexico where the treatment is. So right. we learn a lot from our constituents. And I do, do you hear for animal rights activists, you know, so it's a good thing. Now, do you all, I hope all of you out there in the ether are listening to this because mm -hmm. this is just uh, this is just what we want people uh, to to hear to, to to know from you that you're you're approachable. You want to hear, and uh, and that you learn. And yeah. uh, so and and yeah. our, and our support raised, for example, full of Bobby the Bear. Yep. I mean, um, and I have friends down that way, someone in Newtown that's very involved. And we all put pressure on deep. Any of us that heard about it and it says, what do you mean you're not gonna take care of these cubs? You mm -hmm. know, so not just what happened, which still hopefully there'll be some um, accountability, but um, of how deep handled that also. And it's from listening to our constituents. Um, and I'll tell you, for example, Annie Hornish, I've met her through animal rights, et cetera. And she's always constantly say, hey, Jane, did you see this bill? Hey, Jane, did you hear what happened in Newtown? So right. just short texts that just bring it to your forefront with so much going on, is, mm -hmm. it's a good thing. Right, it helps you kind of uh, sift through the, as you said, thousands of bills that you guys are gonna have to deal with. Um, this this session right and we don't always get the committees that we are top three yeah you know so you know i might not get on environment it doesn't mean that it's not important to me or i don't get on education but it's right. important to me because because you're one of 151 members ultimately that bill <clears throat> will if we get it through the process, you'll be voting on that bill, even right. though you're not there on the committee. And also, <clears throat> you can influence other members of the committee Absolutely. from the outside, right? Right. You know, we all have built relationships with each other. You know, some are closer or whatever. Um, so we do reach out to each other and say, you know what, this bill's really important. What do you think? And that's why you see us like when we're in session and we're in the room, we're like little hamsters running around and everybody's chattering and going. It's not like everybody's there stodgy waiting to vote, you know. We're all talking about all these things going on. And then we go out of the room, we talk more, we meet with um, you know, lobbyists and people from different groups to understand more. Even that being at the Capitol, yeah, go out there, um, hearing from people is important. You know, um, and that's it, the last couple of years has been so strange, right? In the pandemic, I mean, right, for everybody, for so many things, um, but uh, not kind of for us, not being up at the Capitol has been hard. And um, tell me a little bit, are, 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 you know, my understanding is that on the hearing process, that there are going to be some changes this year. They're going to do a mix. I think they're going to do a mix, which is great. I personally love in-person meetings. I would much rather meet with someone for coffee, see them face to face and have a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, we noticed that the hearings that when they went virtual, if you notice some were 24 hours, but a yeah. mom could be home making dinner for her family, you know, be on the Zoom waiting for their turn instead of being up at the Capitol into the wee hours of the night on some of these bills. So it gave more access 
um, to people to be able to testify. And I think they felt safer. Mm. It's, I think it's easier for many people to do it virtually than to be in person. Um, so yeah, I, think I mean, the it, hybrid it, is good. Right. I, it, cause it, so, so that means that if people want to go to the Capitol and yeah. might I add, sit around all day and all night and wait for your three minutes, which is all that is given to people, go for it. Right. right. And they're pretty or, patient because sometimes people have stepped away for a minute when mm -hmm. their name is called and they let them come back on afterwards. So I just get, feel it gives more voice and it gives two different options. And they seem to have that down pat now on how to yeah. do it. Yeah. And our sessions, um, I believe it's important for us to be on the floor as much as possible. During a huge filibuster, I do say it's nice that to be able to go to your office and rest a minute, you know, have a quiet, um, whatever. But during COVID, it's been hard to build those relationships, right? And so much of so much of what happens is all about relationships, right? It is. Yeah, it is. So, so it may not be super important to me, but if a fellow rep comes to me and says, "Hey, Jane, this is really important to me. You know, can we count on your support?" And you know, if it seems like something reasonable, I will support that just because they asked me to. Yeah. So that's right. all important. I may not have thought about it before. Yep. Right. Okay. That's great. That's wonderful, Jane. Thank you. Thank you for having this conversation. No, with us. I mean, it's thank wonderful. you. And the more word that we can get out and um, to do, I, again, your presentation is one of the best I've seen. <laughs> it, it was really good. Um, and um, just reaching out, we've been working with students in the schools and Loomis Chafee School. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, on issues. Uh, and it just goes to show 20 years ago, they tried to do a bill that exonerated those um, convicted and executed for witchcraft. Oh, wow. Way back. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Made fun of it and they kind of dropped it and whatever. Well, that's back on and I am proposing that bill. Um, they're being exonerated around the world and Connecticut was 35 years before Salem. And we had 11 and I get the letters from people all over the country that had a family member and they're in eighth generation now. And it's still on these families mind because they lost everything, you know, yep. um, it's just, so it just shows that reaching out, that wasn't even on my radar, but I have a person who lives in my district whose husband is a descendant. And in Windsor, we did exonerate the, um, the two that were um, executed in Windsor from Windsor, Alice Young was the first. So just that, and they get me up to par, they have Zooms with me, they're teaching me, they send me links and they're very passionate. That's what a group of people can do to influence. Mm -hmm. um, and we've already um, believed that we'll have a hearing on it. So the first part has started. You know, it just goes to, I, I just, I want people to hear that this, you know, we can move the needle, but it takes people Developing relationships with their legislators uh, for that um, for that to happen. Right. Well, thank you, Jane. So very, well, very you. much. It's um, I really appreciate you taking the time and and just having this conversation. And I'm hopeful that I know I'm seeing Q and A's coming through the uh, through the question box that we're going to have questions that uh, we'll we'll talk about uh, at the end of um, our presentation. All right, I'm going to go back to sharing our screen. We just got a few more things. Oh, boy. All right, bear with me for a second. This is always just slightly dicey. Um, aha, moved. How do you like that? Okay, our legislative priorities. And Jane mentioned one of them, which is on... Um, uh, uh, closing that loophole to um, ban grain, greyhound racing. Uh, since she mentioned it, I'm going to talk about it first. You know, Connecticut is one of only three states, I believe, three to four states in the country where greyhound racing is still possible. Connecticut got rid of their tracks, uh, but never got, but never stopped, uh, never um, uh, stopped the law. So the law is still on the book. So if somebody wanted to, to start greyhound racing again in the state, 
there is nothing legally stopping them from doing that. So this is what we're going to try to do this year is get that um, that loophole uh, stopped. Um, the other things I'm going to move up here on uh, number one, which is uh, CVA along with a, a group of both um, animal advocates as well as environmental advocates are um, are trying to move to get some the state to take on some serious non-lethal methods for coexistence with black bears around the state. You know, we haven't done anything in a kind of concerted way in Connecticut. And um, we're not going to talk about this for a, a lot, but, you know, if, if bears can become habituated, they can become very comfortable in neighborhoods because, because we haven't done simple things like secured our trash cans or taken in our bird feeders in the summer. I know this is very hard for those of you that like to watch birds, but there's a lot of plant material out there for birds to, and seeds for birds to feed on during the summer months. And um, getting that attractant away from a bear is a way of starting to reduce the number of interactions we're having with bears in local communities. And there are several communities that have already Im imposed these kinds of local ordinances that says you have to bring in your bird feeder and you have to have certain kinds of of um, uh, secure trash cans. But as their leaders in those towns have said, you know, a bear doesn't know the, doesn't know the town boundary. So if I've got this ordinance in Avon, but I don't have it in, I don't know, name another town close by, um, it, 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 it almost does no good because the bear doesn't know one town from another. So we need to have a more comprehensive approach towards um, these non-lethal methods. So uh, <clears throat> CVA, CVA is a member of something called the Connecticut Bear Coalition. As I said, it is made up of both animal advocates as well as environmental advocates. And that's gonna be uh, our uh, big issue for us this year, as well as stopping a bear hunt, because we know people are out to wanna do that and we don't, and we wanna make sure that they hear from the people in Connecticut that they don't want to kill bears in the state of Connecticut. We want to learn how to live peacefully with our wildlife. Uh, the second priority for CVA, no particular order, uh, is expanding Desmond's Law to all animals. When that bill first came out of, <clears throat> in 2016, when it came out of the Judiciary Committee, it came out with applications to uh, all animals. But when it went to the floor of the House, there were a couple of representatives who said that um, they did not want it to apply to all animals and they would block the bill's passage. Uh, they'd block the bill from coming up for a debate on the floor unless we restricted it just to cats and dogs. There have been a number of, of um, high profile cases involving animals other than dogs, uh, rabbits and horses and some other goats and um, they have not had an advocate in the courtroom because uh, the law doesn't allow it. So this is the idea is to go back to where we were originally and try to expand it to all animals. Big issue this year is gonna be this pet shop issues. We have done this bill, as Jane said, you do it multiple times, so we're back again. Um, this I think will be our fourth or, I have to go back, fourth or fifth year, I can't remember. I think it's, this will be our fourth effort on trying to stop the sale of basically puppy mill animals in Connecticut pet shops. Now, it's particularly urgent in Connecticut right now because New York passed a ban this past summer in June. And they have a lot of pet shops that sell dogs and cats and rabbits. And uh, it has not been signed yet. The bill has not been signed yet by, um, uh, by the governor of New York, but everybody's got their fingers crossed and anticipating that she will sell it, sign it rather. Our concern is that once New York, um, once their ban goes into effect, which happens within a year, there are pet shops along the, you know, the, the area of New York that borders with Connecticut. We know that they're gonna pop right over the other side of the, of the, um, uh, of the state line and they're gonna set up shop in Connecticut. We already, had a new store open up this summer in Stanford. And we know they have connections to New York. So 
this is more urgent this go around than it has been in the past. Um, bringing back again uh, the ban on on exotic animals in circuses and traveling shows. You know we don't have a lot of those kinds of entertainment venues any longer. But we also know that the public doesn't want that. I mean, you know, I think about Cirque du Soleil, which are those, you know, exotic, wonderful, acrobatic people who are in those circuses. That's where that's where the trend is going uh, in circuses. So we're going to bring that bill back again this year. Uh, and lastly, and this is a little, this is a little tough to to because we're just working on this bill. This is on banning the use of rodenticides, and it's because of the impact it has on uh, birds of prey and wildlife in general. It's these, we're not talking about the kind of rodenticides that you buy at Home Depot, but we're talking about the ones that, that are used through pest control agents. So these are very strong poisons that um, have the, um, that, you know, a, a rat or a mouse is killed and then they're out in the, <clears throat> they're outside in the wilderness and they get picked up by a raptor. So an owl or an eagle and, um, and, and the raptor ingests this poisonous <clears throat> uh, mouse and they die this excruciating death. It's, um, it's, a, it's an internal bleed that happens to them and it's so painful and we're losing large numbers of our raptors in Connecticut uh, because of this. California has already done a ban on rodenticides and um, this bill was came up last year and uh, we're trying to pattern some things uh, after uh, the California law. It's That's gonna be a tough road, but you know, it's gonna be one of those things we're gonna continue to push forward on because it's the right thing to do. So those are CVA's priorities for the year. Um, I wanna quickly mention this idea about regional captains. I said to you earlier that we have, uh, we're doing these five workshops because we've cut up the state in five different geographic areas because we're looking for a way of expanding our ability to be able to get people involved. So we're looking at kind of doing a regional approach. We're looking for two or three people in these regions that might be interested in working with us on it and becoming a kind of a captain who would have uh, be responsible for kind of communicating and outreach uh, to their to people in their region. We're going to give them all of the email addresses and so on. We'll make it. We'll help them as much as we can. We're going to do some training with them. Um, we hope that they would be the people who would kind of take on the role of communicating with the with key legislators in that particular region and also be able to garner these people's interests, people who live in that region when there are things like hearings and we need to get people support to support a particular bill. So if you're interested in doing this, it's a really great opportunity to get involved and in get really get down and out with the legislative process. And uh, contact Linda Pleva and uh, Linda P at Connecticut Votes for Animals and she will uh, talk to you uh, more about that. So I think with that, um, we have some time to do some questions and answers. So let me see what we have here. Oh, great. Ah. Okay, we have um, we have somebody who asks, and this is Jane. This is really for you. Um, how common or uncommon is it for an animal protection bill to be placed on the consent calendar? Probably not too often. Um, unfortunately, uh, because for some reason which I don't understand, there's controversy in some of these bills. Um, right. So it just makes it more difficult. Um, they only put on consent agendas, things that I think will easily pass because if there's one thing in there, there's 10 other bills that die. So. Right. And, and that's what I, yeah. I think also, Jane, when I was saying before, sometimes when we get bills, then it's a strategy. If you put the bill in the House or the Senate first, you know, if you get a House person or a Senate person, Sometimes if we get it through the kind of tough spot, 
in the House, we can send it over to the Senate. And by then we've kind of eased out all of the ruffles, if you will. Right, and in the end, it is the um, speaker and his team that decides what hits the floor, what doesn't. And that's why you have to be able to give a little because otherwise some will talk for hours and, and kill the bill. Do we spend three days on, so. Right, right, right. So you'll hear that from us as well. We'll be, when, when we get to that process, when we're close to the floor, somebody will say to us, and this happened with the circus bill last year, somebody threatens to make it a talker, right? I, I mean, when I came to Connecticut and I heard that term, I what is a talker? Yeah. Like the horseshoe bill? Yep, the horseshoe, horseshoe crab bill. Right. Yep. So it's, so for those of you out in the audience, um, you know, it's like a filibuster. That's, they threaten that. And because there's so little time at the end of the year that they've got to get through these bills, they don't want any talkers, right? They don't, right. they don't, I mean, or they make a decision that there are only going to be certain bills that they will um, give, allocate a certain amount of time for. It's never happened on an animal bill. Usually they say, oh, it's a talker, we'll get rid of it. <laughs> but you have to keep going because sometimes we do get them through, so. We do. Um, okay. Uh, oh. Oh, did it, so this is another very interesting, and some very um, uh, clever people on here. First, a couple of things. Uh, Jane, you got a, a great thank you to uh, uh, for your for your advice to advocates from Annie Hornish. She says hello and a big thank you. And um, we have another uh, question. Actually, this is from Christine Dorchek from uh, Gray 2K. She's the uh, Greyhound lady. Mm -hmm. And um, can lawmakers make a, vo a motion for cloture to stop a talker? There is something called call the question that you will see in other legislative, like in your town hall, you know, your town government. We never call the question in the Connecticut legislature. Yeah, we just never call so. Um, what Speaker Ritter did do, which I loved, is before, for my first year, people could read for hours and they would read the same paper and they oh. would just read and read and read. He does not allow reading. You can have notes, you can look down, but you cannot read, whether it's filibustering or putting a bill out, whatever. You're supposed to know your stuff, you know, and talk. So that helps a little bit. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. I didn't, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Okay. All right. Another tip to, to kind of keep in the back of my, um, I'm ready for this. All right. Well, I think that is, I make sure that I've got all the questions that have been asked. Um, Christine Dorchek uh, says that 42 states have now outlawed dog racing. And Oregon just passed their uh, their law in May. She wants to make sure that Connecticut is there in 2023. So we can all hope, right? Right, right. Well, this may be the year, right? So, um, all right, everybody. I think that's it. I were just coming in on time, so I want to thank you all for um, for being with us this evening. I hope you learned. Uh, stuff. And um, I, again, would encourage you, if you're interested in becoming a regional captain, to reach out to Linda or send an email to our info um, uh, email address. Uh, just let us know and we'll be back in touch with you. And um, to get ready, we've got a really, really busy session this year. We got a lot of bills Right, Jane, I mean, you saw that in the caucus, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think most of your priorities are going to be our priorities also. They were on the list. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully we go for more, you know, like shark fins wasn't like one of the top ones, but it's still right. important, so. Important, right, right. Okay, 
All right, everybody. Well, thank you all very much. And um, we'll be seeing you in January. So you'll be hearing from us. We'll be getting stuff out to you. Please open your emails. When you see something from us, open it. We don't like to bother you a lot, but boy, if you don't open those emails, I don't have a way of, at, or get to social media. We don't have a way of communicating with you and we need you. So thank you all very, very much. Have a great evening and an, a great rest of the week. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Jane. Thank you.